Hello everybody. Welcome to our Mount Sinai uh, MBC of Memphis YouTube channel. So happy that you chose to join us today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we say thank you. Thank you for being God. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for bringing us back together again. Father, we thank you and, and we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 13, A Gospel Church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word that it's only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And our scripture uh, continues to come from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. Today we will read verses 1 through 9 of those verses from the NIV. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 9, the NIV version. It says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sostenus, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Paul ends this section with verse 9, which reads, God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Now, those nine verses are power packed. And they were written to the Christians, to written to Christians everywhere, but especially to those in the church that was in Corinth. Uh, a church that at the time of this letter had no resemblance to the words penned by Paul. But I think that is what makes it so amazing. Paul is stating how God sees them, not now that they are, have been accepted, uh, now that they have accepted his son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. I think we are guilty of thinking that Jesus is our Savior because we are saved, but he is only Lord if we let him be. In other words, we accept him as Savior and we make him our Lord if we want to. But the reality is that we don't make him Lord. He is Lord. Jesus is Lord and that has nothing to do with us. Whether we accept him as such does not lessen his Lordship. So Paul starts off this letter to the church by letting them know how God sees them. He says they are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy. They are given grace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. And through this grace, their position has changed from that of the world to being in Christ Jesus. It is their position in Christ that allows God to see them not as they are, 
but covered by the blood of his son Jesus Christ. They are enriched in every way because they are in Christ. Their salvation has been confirmed through the apostles' testimony and through their belief in the word of Christ. Because they are in Christ. That's an important thing. Everything is based on us being in Christ. And because they are in Christ, they lacked no spiritual gift. And they will, they will be presented to God as blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes back, all those who have put their faith in him, all those who are in Christ will pres be presented to God as blameless. And, and now in verse 9, which is our emphasis for today, Paul says, God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. One of the things we forget or take for granted is that we are called into fellowship with Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. God doesn't just save us and then say, see ya. He invites us into an intimate relationship with his son. And that is a forever thing until Christ returns. And even after, it, it's, it's not just a Sunday thing. In Acts, the second chapter, verse 42, one of the four things that the early church devoted themselves to was fellowship. Acts 2 and 42 says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So fellowship was a very important part for meeting together. I know for me, while our church met virtually for almost two years, one of the things most missed was fellowship with other believers. Most churches figured out a way for virtual worship and even group meetings and even Bible study. But fellowship was the hardest to go without. So what is fellowship? I think what we have come to think of fellowship is a long way from what the early church considered it to be. We tend to think of fellowship as what we do before service and after service. And most importantly, we think of fellowship as the activity that takes place in the fellowship hall. When I was a kid growing up in church, just based on observation, which means nobody said this to me, it's just I formed an opinion uh, that the fellowship hall was the part of the building where adults could go and laugh and joke and gossip and, you know, we ate in the fellowship hall and we just had fun, just overall fun in the fellowship hall. Us kids could run around, we could talk loudly, we could chew gum, we could just have fun. Now, from my observation, again, nobody told me this. I just observed. So from my observation, I grew up thinking that you can do anything in the fellowship hall, even tell an occasional lie or two. Sad to say, I was an adult before I realized that the fellowship hall was just as holy as the sanctuary. But from reading Acts, the second chapter, verse 42, we are not surprised that the early church devoted themselves to the apostle doctrine, to the teaching. That comes as no surprise. You, we, we, we expect them uh, to devote themselves to the apostle doctrine, to teaching. And, and we're not surprised that they devoted themselves to prayer, even though it's hard to get a devoted group to prayer in our day. 
And we're not even surprised that they devoted themselves in breaking of bread. Because, you know, we love to eat. But to continue steadfastly in fellowship, to devote themselves to fellowship, that's one of those things that made me go, hmm. When I stop to consider it, fellowship is so watered down that we do it if and only if we have time. And even if we have a fellowship dinner in the fellowship hall, even from our weak definition of the word in the 21st century, we still consider it spending time with one another. But folk will stop by the fellowship hall at the fellowship dinner, not to fellowship, but to get a to-go plate. And if you say no, it's, you know, if, if they come in and say, can I just get a to-go plate? And you say, no, it's a fellowship dinner. Meaning come in and take a seat and fellowship. I'll just say, if you say no to that to-go plate, you better have on your whole armor. But Luke tells us that the early church, the early Christians, didn't just have fellowship if they had time, if they felt like being bothered, and if they weren't mad at anybody. And the ifs can go on and on and on. But he tells us that they devoted themselves to fellowship. This means that fellowship was a priority. And one of the objectives for gathering together was fellowship. They made fellowship a priority. I think that in, in one of the lessons, I think that one of the lessons from the COVID-19 era, where we all participated in virtual church, uh, depending on the kind of technology you had in, in your home or in your car or wherever you were streaming the services. One thing you could not do after the virtual service was go up to the streaming device and give somebody a big hug or, or shout amen and, and it be heard by anybody but you. One of the things for me as, as a Bible study teacher, one, one, one of the things that most affected me in the beginning, and I still have problems, I'm st I still haven't gotten over it in over two years, it's just that, it is that lack of fellowship, you know, no smiling faces, no occasional nod or amen, just me and a computer screen with a camera on it. That, that was and is, it's very lonely. I, I know some pastors that try the uh, uh, online, you know, just kind of sitting in a room doing the sermon, and, and they decided no. And they went to the actual church, the empty church, the empty building, and took a few deacons and maybe a couple people so that they could record and have actual people to hear the service, to hear the sermon. I totally get that. There is just no substitute for actual fellowship with other believers. For actually going to church, I know it's just a building, but still going and worshiping with other like-minded believers. Of course, fellowship is, is much deeper than what I've described thus far, but that is where our minds typically go when we talk about fellowship in the church. It involves getting together uh, for sharing needs, for prayer, for Bible study, for encouragement, for comfort and the edification of one another. And without it, we tend to grow away from the word and our faith 
becomes dull. We this this thing called salvation is not a lone ranger type thing. We we're, we're not just all by ourselves. Fellowship in the early church had a much deeper meaning than our use of the word in our day and time. In fact, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. It means companionship or partnership and communion with others on the basis of something shared in common. In the New Testament, <clears throat> the first and most important thing that was shared is a common relationship with Jesus Christ. The word koinonia was never used to refer to worldly, worldly gatherings. It always had a spiritual significance and meaning. They never thought of fellowship as just having common interests or a, as a family reunion or any of the worldly functions that we do and put the label fellowship on it. Even the idea, that idea of just coming together and calling it fellowship and, 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 and Christ was nowhere in it. Even the idea was foreign to them. I don't know what type of gatherings, what type of gatherings like, you know, when folks just got together. I don't know what it was called, but it was not called fellowship. In the New Testament, believers can have fellowship and share together because, first of all, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. To them, to have fellowship is only possible if you first share Jesus in common. First, uh, first John, the first chapter, verse 3, the NIV says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Until I was studying this lesson, I never thought much about the practice that happens, uh, at least at our church, after a person is baptized and it happens all the time after a person is baptized then we give them what's called a hand of fellowship which means that we are welcoming them into not just the local church but into the family of god so fellowship is first the sharing together in a common life with other believers through a relationship with God, through Jesus Christ. We cannot have fellowship, true fellowship, and not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Fellowship is first and foremost a relationship rather than an activity. And it's because so often we think, when we think of fellowshipping, we think of an activity. But fellowship is first and foremost a relationship. And it's a relationship with Jesus Christ that binds us together. And it, this also, with, with saying that, it gives us a smooth transition into what true fellowship really is. But it also moves us right into the end of this lesson. So until next time, take care, be blessed, and come back and join us as we discuss true fellowship. Until then, bye-bye.